Welcome, everybody. Thanks for joining us today. Uh, this is our annual Constitution Day event. Constitution Day commemorates the formation and signing of the United States Constitution on September 17th, 1787. That's 231 years ago today. And in many places, on many campuses, there are events held that recognize this uh, occasion, and it gives us an opportunity to learn about the Constitution. So Rowan's uh, observance of Constitution Day this year comes one day late, but will feature an address on the Constitution and the lessons of Charlottesville by Delaware Law School Dean and Professor of Law and noted constitutional scholar Rodney Smola. Now, Dean Smola has written extensively on matters relating to constitutional law, civil rights, freedom of speech, mass media issues involving libel and privacy. He's published law review articles, legal treatises, law school case books, and books for university, trade, and popular publishing companies. He's most recently served as the First Amendment advisor to a task force convened by the governor of Virginia to study the events that transpired in Charlottesville last year. So we're very happy to welcome Dean Smola to Rowan University once again. And without further ado, Dean Rodney Smola on the Constitution and the lessons of Charlottesville. Thank you. I see some folks standing and I see some seats empty up here. If you, you should feel free um, to come on up. So I'm going to talk to you about uh, the national debate that has gone on for 200 years about the meaning of freedom of speech, which is a debate we have as citizens and also a debate that exists in our constitutional law and that gets litigated in the Supreme Court of the United States. I think of, the, of that debate as largely 100 years old, as really beginning in earnest around World War I and, a, and as moving through the last 100 years to where we are right now, 100 years after World War I. That's a little bit simplistic because People were thinking about the meaning, meaning of freedom of speech during colonial times. Uh, in the early days of the Republic, during the presidency of John Adams, uh, laws called the Alien and Sedition Acts were passed. They were extraordinarily um, uh, draconian in their censorship. They made it a crime to criticize the Congress, a crime to criticize the president, uh, the, just beyond our imagination today. There was a great debate during that period about whether the, those laws did or didn't violate the First Amendment. But we really didn't get into deep thought as a country about the meaning of free speech, in my view, until around World War I. Now, I'm a litigator. I, I argue cases all over the United States. I've argued in the Supreme Court of the United States, and I do a lot of writing on the First Amendment and freedom of speech. And it can seem really complicated. So I have a tre one treatise of mine is 1,000 pages long or so, many volumes, 27 chapters, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of subparts. You think, geez, this is very complicated stuff. It's like, it's like tax law or something. It's, really, it's very intricate. But I actually think, despite all of that tremendous complexity, that you can boil down the last 100 years of debate as a brilliant debate a powerful debate between two very attractive but opposing conceptions of what freedom of speech is. And both of these have been around for about 100 years, and they both have tremendous intuitive appeal. I, I find myself moved by both of them and attracted by both of them. So I'm going to describe at the beginning a little bit what these two ideas are, try to give you a sense for how they're different and then give you a little bit of a history lesson as to how they battled out. Because sometimes one idea has prevailed, sometimes the other idea has prevailed. They both exist today in our culture, they both exist today in our law, but I'll give you a feel for sort of where things are. Then I'll talk to you a little bit about the um, tragic events in Charlottesville last summer and the swirling conflicts that surrounded that, which I was involved in to a significant degree. Uh, and then I'm gonna be quiet and we can, have, we can exercise some freedom of speech and have some dialogue about these ideas or anything that concerns you about what I'm going to talk to you about. So here are my names for the two ideas. These are my nicknames. You don't have to use them, but they're, they're my little shorthands for them. The first is what I will call the order and morality theory. 
And the second is what I will call the marketplace theory. The sort of arbitrary names, but these are, these are the, the names I'm going to give to the two competing theories. So let me first describe the order and morality theory. This is the theory that most civilized nations in the world today follow. It is the theory of free speech that you would see in Europe. It's the theory of free speech that you'd see in most modern democracies. In the United States, it has its most beautiful articulation in a 1942 case called Chaplinsky versus New Hampshire. This was a case involving a Jehovah's Witness street preacher who was preaching in a small town and making negative remarks about Catholics and, and others and causing some people who were walking by where he was giving this fiery speech to get agitated and upset and begin to show some signs of, 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 of disgruntlement and perhaps even there could be some sort of disorder. And a police officer doing an excellent job, in my view, walked up to this person, Walter Chaplinsky, and basically said, you know, maybe you should chill, maybe you should come back another day. Um, it's, getting a little, it's getting a little disorderly here. I'm worried for safety. Why don't you just move on down and um, come back another time? And w Mr. Chaplinsky did not like that. He, he, he thought he had a free speech right to preach his negative <laughs> statements against Catholics and others, to preach his views of, of being a Jehovah's Witness, and he wouldn't back down. So he kept talking and he kept talking, and the crowd got more restless, and finally the police officer said, I'm gonna have to, I'm gonna have to move you out of this scene. He didn't place him under arrest originally, but he sort of said, you gotta come with me, I gotta move you off this street corner. At which point, Walter Chaplinsky lost his temper, and he swore at the police officer. Now there's a disagreement in the record. According to the police, he said, you're a goddamn fascist, and all of the city of Rochester are goddamn fascists. Walter Chaplinsky swears he did not use God's name in vain, but he admits he called these people fascists. Come on in, folks, sit down, make yourself, you can sit up in the front here too if you want, there's more room if you wanna come this way. So that case went to the Supreme Court of the United States. The state of New Hampshire argued that it could arrest Walter Chaplinsky for disorderly conduct and for swearing at a police officer, basically. Kind of a, like a baseball player getting thrown out of a game for swearing at an umpire. And Chaplinsky said, no, I have a free speech right to say everything I said. I had a free speech right to make my speech. I had a free speech right to insult the police officer. And Justice Frank Murphy wrote the opinion for the Supreme Court. And in two paragraphs, but really in two sentences, he set forth one of the most beautiful articulations of the order and morality theory of freedom of speech in the history of the world. He basically said, there are certain kinds of utterances, certain kinds of statements that the government can prosecute and it creates no constitutional problem. And then he gave some examples. He talked about libelous speech and profane speech. And then he talked about what he called fighting words. And he used an interesting definition of fighting words. He said fighting words are those words which have a tendency to immediately provoke a breach of peace. So you say something and someone's gonna hit you in the mouth or throw something at you or wrestle with you, you know, like the old Westerns, those are fighting words, right? So he said it, it, it's fighting words are those things that could provoke a breach of peace, peace. But then he used another phrase that's absolutely fascinating. He said, or words which by their very utterance inflict injury, the saying of the word, inflicts injury. And then he said that these statements have been observed to contribute nothing to the, to the serious exposition of ideas. They contribute nothing to the discovery of truth. And whatever slight value they have toward the discovery of truth 
is outweighed by society's interests in order and morality. And if you think about what I talked about, a fighting word can either be it's going to create a fight or the word itself is like an emotional bullet. The word itself causes me injury. Notice how beautifully parallel that is to order and morality. And so the idea is that in a good society, in a decent society, you're not allowed to swear at other people. You're not allowed to swear at a cop. You're not allowed to use racial pejoratives, the N-word. You're not allowed to insult human dignity. Because what we know is that this doesn't lead to any discovery of truth. This is not the serious exposition of any idea. This is simply inflicting pain, creating the possibility of disorder or creating the possibility of deep hurt to human dignity. And in a decent society, we can tell the difference between speech that will lead to some serious exposition, something that we care about in politics or religion or science or art, and this kind of speech, which today we often call hate speech. They didn't have that term back then. So that was, that was an, an incredibly, just in two sentences, a beautiful statement of the order and morality theory. That theory dominated American law for the first 50 years of the last 100 years. And it reached its apex in 1952 in a lawsuit from my own sweet home, Chicago. <clears throat> Chicago, like so many places in the United States, a deeply polarized, racially torn city for much, much, much of its history. Uh, if you've ever seen the great old movie, The Blues Brothers, there's a moment where Jake and Elwood Blues, Blues are confronting the Illinois Nazis, these Nazis marching through <laughs> Illinois, and they run, they run them in, into the water with the Blues Mobile. Well, there have always been racial supremacist groups, Nazi groups, skinhead groups in Illinois and in Chicago. It's one of the birthplaces of American um, supremacist racism. And there was, in the early 1950s, a racist group that called itself the White Circle League. And the leader of this racist group was a man named Beauharnais. And the White Circle League in the south side of Chicago, which is a largely African-American part of Chicago, but it also has white neighborhoods, was circulating leaflets. And the leaflets were racist diatribes against people of color. And the leaflets talked about how blacks should be sent back to Africa, talked about how they were inferior, they were prone to violence, and how we need to, to do things about um, in, uh, the threat of integration. This was before Brown versus the Board of Education, but there were starting to be stirrings. And so it was a vicious, racist diatribe being passed out in leaflets in the city of Chicago. <coughs> Illinois had a law making it a crime to disparage any racial group. And Mr. Beauharnais was arrested and convicted for passing out his leaflets. He took his case to the Supreme Court of the United States, a case called Beauharnais versus Illinois. And he argued he had a free speech right to pass out his racist leaflets. And that there was no proof that his leaflets were going to cause any violence. And he said, you have to show that there was a clear and present danger of violence, and that you've got no proof of that. All you've got is these, these pamphlets that make these statements that you don't like. And the Supreme Court of the United States rejected Beauharnais's claim and said the leaflets were not protected under our conception of freedom of speech. And the Supreme Court invoked the order and morality theory from Chaplinsky versus New Hampshire. Justice Frankfurter, who was the only Jewish member of the court, openly alluded to Hitler and the Holocaust and the Third Reich, essentially saying, we know where this kind of hate speech le leads. Look, look at what happened in Europe. And then he said, but Illinois didn't have to look to Europe to realize how evil this kind of racist speech is. And he talked about the history of racial violence in Illinois. And then he said, invoking the order morality theory, Illinois was entitled to reach the judgment 
that this kind of speech has a tendency to provoke violence, but whether or not it does, it eats at the social fabric. It eats at our sense of community. It eats at our sense of human dignity. And therefore, it's not protected under the First Amendment. Now, I find Chaplinsky and Beauharnais to be incredibly <laughs> powerful, magnetic, attractive conceptions of freedom of speech. Now I'm going to tell you the opposite theory. And you're going to see how schizophrenic I can be, because my problem is I also see the other one. Okay. The other theory I'm going to call the marketplace theory, and it dates back 100 years. It's most famously associated with two Supreme Court justices, Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes and Justice Louis Brandeis. And Justice Holmes, in his early days as a Supreme Court justice, basically adopted the order and morality theory, basically was willing to send people that dissented from World War I people that were labor activists, uh, people that were progressives who were agitating in places like New York, basically willing to send them to the penitentiary. He sent a very famous American politician, Eugene Debs, to the penitentiary for making an anti-war speech. But then he had a kind of strange metamorphosis, all kind of almost like a co political conversion experience. And he became a prophet of the marketplace theory. And his most famous opinion is a case called, in a case called Abrams versus the United States. This was a case in which uh, anti-war protesters were distributing leaflets largely in Yiddish from a tenement building in New York City. They were anti-war statements. Uh, they, they, they talked about the draft and compared the draft to slavery. And Mr. Abrams was arrested and prosecuted for obstructing the draft and obstructing the war effort. And Holmes had been entirely in favor of throwing these people in the federal penitentiary for, for the early part of his career. There's a fascinating story, I won't go into it now, about a train ride he took from Washington to Boston in which he sat next to a person who was another famous judge and they had a discussion. They were talking about this Harvard law professor that they both had who was criticizing Holmes and that may have been the thing that changed Holmes' mind. We'll never know, but it's a fascinating anecdote. But anyway, in Abrams, he articulated the marketplace theory, and it is a radical theory. In it, he said that we have to tolerate even speech that we loathe and believe fraught with death. I'm not making it up. That's his, those are his words. That we loathe and believe fraught with death. That's heavy unless an immediate check is needed on the speech to save the country. I mean, to save the country. <laughs> and it has to be an immediate check. And so he took us light years from the, market play, from, from, from the order of morality theory. He said that if, it's, if what, you're what you're complaining about is violence, if you're, complaining, if you're worried about disorder, it's got, even though the speech is fraught with death, it's got to be right on the verge of happening before you can do anything about it. Otherwise, you have to tolerate it. The Holmes view lost. Holmes, Holmes was a dissenter. The other justices did not buy this radical theory. He eventually got a compatriot. He eventually got an ally in Louis Brandeis. And Louis Brandeis, in a case in the 1930s involving the prosecution of a communist leader, a case called Whitney versus California, joined with Holmes, and Brandeis wrote a less poetic, a less uh, emotional dissent, but a more analytic dissent. And Brandeis made a number of arguments, very, very brilliant, not necessarily easy to accept. He first argued that when you see violent speech, you see Nazi speech, you see Richard Spencer's speech, you see you know, white supremacist speech, you see the speech of al-Qaeda or terrorist groups, your natural tendency is to want to throw the people in jail and suppress it. And, and Holmes talked about this. That's our instinct. Throw those people in jail. But Holmes and Brandeis, particularly Brandeis, argued it never works. The idea actually gets greater strength when you try to suppress it. Now, you don't have to accept this. I'm not, I'm not telling you you have to believe him, but that was his theory, that when you drive hate speech underground, 
you, it actually strength builds around it. The people feel persecuted, it adds fuel to it, it makes them stronger. Um, I lived in the South for a while, and there's a weed there called kudzu. I don't know if you probably have seen it, but, but kudzu is this, this, this introduced species that will just take over your highways, take over your yards, take over your forests. And when you, if you get, get kudzu in your yard, you better call somebody who knows what they're doing. Because if you do the natural thing, which is you just try to hack the hell out of it and, and, and just whack it back and stab it and everything, it comes back 10 times stronger. <laughs> All right? You got to really get down deep and get, get, to get rid of it. Well, that's kind of what Brandeis is saying, that you throw Nazis in jail, you throw supremacists in jail, you get more Nazis, you get more supremacists, you build their power. So that was one of his theories. The other was that, why do we want to throw these people in jail? Largely out of fear. We're, we're afraid of them. We're afraid of their ideas. And he said, you can't legislate out of fear. It's not, it's not the best way to run a free country. And he argued that the framers of the Constitution were fearless and that they didn't want us to legislate out of fear. And then in one of his most brilliant lines, it's one of the most powerful lines ever by a Supreme Court justice, he refers to the Salem witch trials. And he said, men feared witches and burnt women. So a, a great line. So now you have these two incredibly powerful competing notions and people on both sides of this debate. On the marketplace side, as others rallied to it, they began to say, one of the problems we have with the order and morality theory is that it puts the government in charge of deciding what is contrary to our morality or what has a tendency to undermine order. The two ideas are vying, but the marketplace theory is losing and the order and morality theory is winning. And then what happened? my generation introduced the 1960s. <laughs> and in the 1960s, everything changed. <laughs> and the Vietnam protests, and the civil rights movement, and the assassination of John Kennedy, and the election of Lyndon Johnson, all of these things swirling around, leading up into the early 1970s, and Richard Nixon, and Watergate, it was a time of tremendous ferment in the United States, including, bless you, including the Supreme Court. And in the 1950s a little bit, but then in the 60s and in the early 70s, there was a revolution in the Supreme Court, a liberal re revolution, in which the Supreme Court created an explosion of protection for civil rights, protection for freedom of religion, protection for freedom of speech, protection of the criminally accused, the beginnings of the right to privacy. And so as part of that, one of the things that happened, this happens every so often in our constitutional law. It's one of the reasons there's this tremendous debate over Judge Kavanaugh, because we could be on the cusp of another giant change, okay? One of the things that happened is that free speech law flipped upside down. And the order and morality theory went from the dominant theory to the recessive theory. And the marketplace theory became the dominant theory. And the marketplace theory has basically been the dominant theory in our open spaces in society, particularly streets, sidewalks, parks, today the internet. Now, it's a little more complicated than that, but that's, that's sort of the narrative. But the order and morality theory has not lost its strength. It's behind now in the Supreme Court, but it hasn't lost its, its, its power. And the two ideas continue to vie. And you saw them so powerfully represented in the events of Charlottesville. Now, before I go to the Charlottesville event, let me tell you that you might think what I'm saying is, it was all order and morality, order and morality, order and morality until the 19, late 50s, and then it flipped and it became marketplace. But it's not quite so simple. Because today, in 2018, in our formal law, our formal free speech law, we use the marketplace theory in, for some segments of society, but we still use the order and morality theory for other segments. And the basic divide works this way. I've already suggested it to you. 
in our open spaces, the open spaces of this campus, the open spaces of the surrounding parts of New Jersey, the, the, the vast you know, corridors of our society where we gather, we march, we, we protest, we speak digitally. There, the marketplace theory dominates. But we have contained spaces where it's not the same. The biggest would be the workplace. So in the American workplace, in the, both whether you're working for a government agency or you're working in the private sector, we use the order and morality theory. If you use the N-word or you insult someone based on their sexuality or their gender or you engage in racist diatribes or sexist diatribes, you can be fired. And the law sometimes will require you to be fired. Your employer must fire you because you're creating what's called a hostile environment. If you're a coach coaching at Rowan and you get in the face of an athlete and you, 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 you utter a racial pejorative, good luck trying to invoke the marketplace theory. You're going to lose your job. And in fact, Title IX may force you to lose your job because we say either that that is disruptive and disorderly or we say, you know what? It shouldn't be the price of being a college soccer player that you have to put up with insults and it insults your dignity. The words in, their, in themselves create injury. If you're a professor in a classroom, you're a student in a classroom, the order and morality theory reigns. It reigns right now in this room. You could be taken out of this room for things that you'd be protected in saying out on the street. But in here, we expect a measure of civility, a measure of respect, a measure of decorum, a measure of professionalism. This is a community of scholars and students. We're here together. And so the, the, the order and morality theory trumps inside here. So it's fascinating that we have these two different sort of worlds. We, we, we can be the most fit, one of the most famous examples. I'll tell you a joke about, not a joke, but a funny story about it later, later in this talk involved a Vietnam era case in which someone was wearing on a jacket the F-bomb. I always wonder whether I should say the word or not. It's in the Supreme Court. I'll tell you the story later. But it said, fuck the draft. All right. Hope you didn't get that on the camera. All right. So, <laughs> F the draft. That's what it says on his jacket. He's arrested. His case goes to the Supreme Court of the United States. The Supreme Court of the United States said he had a constitutional right to wear that F-bomb on his jacket. So that's a rejection of order and morality. It's a rejection of Chaplinsky. Think how, think how graphic that jacket was, Cohen's, compared to what poor Mr. Chaplinsky said, which doesn't sound bad at all. You're a goddamn fascist. I mean, the F-bomb's much worse than that, but it's totally different results. But here's what the courts have said. Yeah, yeah, dude, you can wear that in the street. <laughs> but you cannot wear that on school property. <laughs> you cannot wear that inside a government building necessarily because now we require greater decorum, et cetera. So you get the idea. One thing we know is that lower grade public schools are governed by the order and morality theory. Public middle schools, public high schools, the Supreme Court has decided a series of cases in which speech that's really not all that bad, nevertheless can get you kicked out of school and the Supreme Court will back up the principal, all right, will back up the school board. So the order and morality theory governs there. In the world you're in now, the world of universities, in the world I've spent a large part of my life, one of the great debates is what is a college campus? Should it be treated like the open marketplace in which the open marketplace theory reigns? Or should it be treated as a place in which we use the order and morality theory? You all can say whatever you want about each other's religion and race and ethnicity and sexuality, whatever you want. But if you step on this campus, you're in Chaplinsky land, you better be, you better be civilized, all right? Um, and there have been lawsuits and debates over which of those theories should govern, both at state universities and in private universities. Um, and it's, a, it's an ongoing debate. It's part of the backdrop of Charlottesville because a lot of the marches were on the UVA campus there. 
And so it, the, the, the question that I'm posing was, was placed there. I'm going to end now. I'm going to end by just do, talking a little bit about the Charlottesville stuff. And then we have time for plenty of time for our, our own debate and, and discussion back and forth. Um, first thing you should know is that, is that I, I bear some guilt in all of this. Um, I argued in the Supreme Court of the United States a, a, quite a famous Supreme Court decision called Virginia versus Black. I was the principal lawyer. I had evil clients, the Ku Klux Klan and cross burners. Virginia made it a crime to burn the cross because it was a symbol of the Ku Klux Klan, essentially. And I argued that the Klan had a right to burn a cross. It didn't have a right to threaten people. It didn't have a right to intimidate people. But that every time the Klan has a rally in which they burn the cross, in this particular case, they were burning it in protest against Hillary Clinton and Bill Clinton, that every time they have a rally and they sing Amazing Grace and they burn the cross, that's not always an incitement to riot. That's not always a threat. And you've got to go case by case. That was my argument. One, when the racists were descending on Charlottesville, and you may not remember how that summer went, but it was actually, it was actually a series of events. So it began in May with a supremacist rally. Then there was in July a Ku Klux Klan rally. Then there was the big Unite the Right uh, rally that resulted in the tragic death of Heather Hare um, in, in August. So there were a series of events. As they were going through this conflict in Charlottesville, I got called by the ACLU to see if I would represent the racists. Because I had argued Virginia versus black and it was a fairly well-known free speech lawyer. I couldn't bring myself to do it. I said, no, go have them get somebody else. I stayed out of it. Because I stayed out of it, after the events unfolded and there was an effort to try to <coughs> deconstruct what had happened, to figure out what things went right, what things went wrong, sort of sort out the mess. Uh, the governor of Virginia, the former governor of Virginia, Terry McAuliffe, created a task force of various people to look into everything that happened. And I was asked to be the, the constitutional advisor to the task force. If I had been a lawyer in the case, I couldn't have done it. But because I was out of the case, I was able to try to provide advice about it. And I ultimately ended up writing a book about the whole experience. I'm trying to get a publisher for it now. I just finished writing it a few weeks ago. Um, I've, I've been deeply conflicted myself about the events, about the legal theories, about whether the speech should be deemed protected or unprotected, about all of the swirl of it. Um, I think that's a good place to stop. I'm going to stop and let's start a dialogue and start accepting your <coughs> questions and discussion. So you talk about the marketplace theory. What do you think about the... Not, not like you say that marketplace is that everyone, anyone's allowed to like say what they want. But what if society, not the government, not like an organized force? What if just the people around them reject that? Is like yeah. that is that completely fine in your opinion? Yeah, great, great, great question. So the question is, I talked about the marketplace theory. What if it's not the government engaged in censorship, but the people around them? So, so you have there, there are several several layers to that. So let me give you. I'll give you two layers of answer. First of all. I comport myself under the order and morality theory. <laughs> and that's what I teach my children, and that's what I teach my students. Now, it's a free country. They don't have to agree with me. But, but I, I, I'm conscious of the way I use my words. I'm conscious of the, of the things I say. And I hate people that aren't. I don't like people that feel that, as human beings, they have an entitlement to inflict injury, emotional injury, psychic injury, injury to human dignity. I don't like racists, and I don't like that insult. And I believe that there's a tremendous amount of social pressure throughout our society that works very effectively and appropriately. And it's actually, it fits within, it fits within the Holmes-Brandeis model, because one of the things they said is the best the best remedy against evil counsels are good counsels. So the best thing to do is to counter the bad speech and shame the bad speech, and, and, and that's actually more effective than law. So that's one level of answer. And, and I, I'm, I'm a very aggressive, 
um, you know, I was an old athlete, adrenaline flow, lawyer, but I never have said a bad thing about any opponent. I, some of my best friends are the lawyers on the other side. I, I'm, I'm, I'm a, you know, I'm, I'm like an NBA player that has never had a technical foul in, in, in you know, in, in, in his life. I'm very, I'm very, you know, clean in that, in that respect. Much more than a lot of people around me. And I think it's effective. Now, there's a deeper, I think, question that you have. And it's, it's called the heckler's veto problem. And it's one of the biggest headaches in American constitutional law. I, I, th I think this is what you, you're, you were sort of asking. So you, and it's, it's, it's posed by the Charlottesville event so graphically. You've got a group of people engaged in speech that almost everybody finds disgusting. So you've got all these different right-wing supremacist groups descending on Charlottesville, and almost every American of goodwill, Republican, Democrat, liberal, conservative, rejects their racist messages. And so they want to show up in mass as counter-protesters, which is what typically happens. In most of the right-wing rallies, the counter-protesters nowadays vastly outnumber the bad guys. And in some of the rallies in the last couple of months, the bad guys, you know, they tried to do that anniversary of Charlottesville. It was like, you know, 25 or 30 racists showed up and 4,000, you know, counter protesters, including my own children showed up on the, on the other side in, in, in Washington. But what are, what are the rules of the game? And so I can tell you the rules, um, but that doesn't make it easy for police officers and others. The, the, the rule in the open marketplace is that you can scream at the other people, you can yell at them, but you can't interfere with them. You can't shove them, you can't lock arms to prevent them from getting into where they're trying to go, you can't throw stuff at them, you can't spit at them. So you can scream at them and try to shout them down, at least in the open marketplace, but you can't physically obstruct them. You can't yourself break the law. You can't engage in an assault. You can't engage in a battery you can't, and so on. Um, because of the dynamic of the bad guys wading through thousands and thousands and thousands of good people to get to a particular place. In Charlottesville, they wanted to get to the Robert E. Lee statue or the Stonewall Jackson statue, these monuments to the Confederacy. The police tend to be put in a position that makes the police look like they're siding with the bad guys. Because there's thousands and thousands and thousands of hecklers, there's a hundred bad guys, a hundred racists trying to get through, and Charlottesville was more than that eventually. And the police tended to put their backs to the racists and face the counter-protesters with their weapons, with whatever they had, with their barricades. And the counterpressor basically interpreted that visually as you've got, you're protecting the Klan. You're protecting Richard Spencer. You're on their side. And I think one of the lessons is for every cop that's facing this way, there should be a cop that's facing that way. <laughs> and the other lesson is put out a zillion cops and put up real physical barricades. Use overwhelming force to keep the, to keep the group separate. Now, I'm sorry for a long answer. I won't be so long with everybody, but such an important question. A different rule applies inside a room like this. And there are actually cases that describe the difference between what takes place on the street and inside a room like this where people are invited by a university, et cetera. And the rule, and the rule there is that the university or the sponsors of the event have a right for the audience to hear the speaker, even if it's a speaker they want to yell and scream at. And so if they get so disruptive that the speaker can't give the talk, then in theory, the speaker, you should remove the, the, the audience that is being disruptive and the, those that want to listen to the speaker should listen to the speaker. When I was in college, the leader of American forces in Vietnam, General William Westmoreland, came to give a speech about the Vietnam War. And 3,000 students, I was among them, went to the auditorium and screamed and shouted so long that General Westmoreland couldn't give his speech. In theory, we could have all been arrested. In th it's, it's a lot like that Chaplinsky problem, if you think about it. Um, we would have had a right to scream and yell and be as disruptive as we wanted if he'd been doing it outside. <laughs> but inside, 
you're, you're supposed to be able to listen. And in enlightened universities, I think, <laughs> look for some way to mediate it. So, you know, I've been in charge of these sessions where I've said, protesters, when the person comes in, you can stand, you can raise your signs, you can turn your back, but then when he's ready, he or she's ready to speak, you've got to be down, you've got to be quiet, you can keep holding the sign, you know. So you're sort of like trying to accommodate the message of the hecklers and the message of the speaker. But when push comes to shove, I think inside an invited event, you have to let the speaker speak. I was a university president and we had a conservative group that specialized in bringing the most controversial speakers they, they possibly could locate in the United States to the campus because they wanted to provoke the protest and, and, and create a scene. And so it was a never ending headache to try to accommodate the free speech rights of that group, but also accommodate the rights of those trying to protest against the group. There's a zillion, um, issues I'm happy to engage you on. Due to a lot of these more aggressive protests like in Charlottesville, do you think that we should um, evaluate how these are taught in um, American education systems on how we debate these certain issues? Yeah, good luck with that. <laughs> so, you know, we live in such, an, such a terribly polarized time in our, in our official politics. I mean, we have a president that's highly polarizing. We have people that strongly disagree about fundamental issues of our you know, country's future. <coughs> and those debates are not always conducted civilly, let alone the way we debate and discuss on the streets. And you know, there's been, in my view, um, sophisticated training and escalation that is that essentially pretty close to crossing a line from civil protest to deliberate civil disobedience and, and violence on the right and the left. And you have you know, some groups on the left that are extremely well-schooled in disruptive tactics and groups on the right that are extremely well-schooled in disruptive tactics. I'm old school in the sense that I think in our open places you still should follow the marketplace rules. So it doesn't matter to me which side is on there, they're allowed to come, but I think police have the right to clamp down immediately at the first sign of some crossing of that line to violence. And one of the, one of the criticisms in the aftermath of Charlottesville was that the police, and this included many different police forces, county police, city of Charlottesville police, Virginia State Police, National Guard forces, it had been driven into them that they didn't want to be the escalators of violence. And they had looked at the events in Ferguson, Missouri, and, and they, they didn't want to be the police officers that looked like they were cracking people on the head and, and preventing freedom of speech. They had been driven into them. And so they had, they had been kind of trained in a psychology of passivity, of non-intervention. And that may, in retrospect, have been a mistake. Because then when skirmishes began to erupt when a right-wing guy would batter a counter-protester with a, with, a, with, a, with a shield or a sword, or, the, or they'd pull somebody out and start to, to pummel somebody. The police were passive, and as that passivity set in, the violence escalated and erupted everywhere. Um, and so I think probably the better lesson is, yeah, you have to observe freedom of speech, but you should have zero tolerance for anybody that starts anything physical, if you, if you can. Yes, sir. I know that some universities have designated free speech areas on their campus. Do the courts recognize those designations in terms of this, the two uh, yeah. theories? Yeah. And a follow-up, if they do, uh, how would the courts respond theoretically to a law passed by a state that said each university <laughs> must have a free yeah. speech area? Okay, those are great questions. First of all, let me distinguish between public and private universities. So I see someone wearing a Duke shirt that back there, which is where I went to law school. And so let me just give you a little thought experiment. Right down the road from Duke is the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. About 10 miles separate the two campuses. Duke's a private university. Chapel Hill's a public university. On the Duke campus, there are no free speech rights. Freedom of speech doesn't apply to private entities. It only applies to actions by the government. And so when we have this great debate about the free speech rights of NFL football players to kneel during the national anthem, technically the football players have no free speech rights against most of the NFL franchises 
because most NFL teams are owned by private entities. There's one NFL team, you can amaze your friends with this piece of trivia, there's one NFL team that's owned by the government. Anybody know what it is? The Green Bay Packers are owned by the city of Green Bay. It's cool, actually. <laughs> so a Green Bay Packer player has a First Amendment right, <laughs> but my team, the Bears, they don't, technically, all right? So and technically, a Duke student or a Duke professor doesn't have a free speech right against Duke University, but a University of North Carolina professor or a North Carolina student does. But of course, if you ask students at Duke, do they have the same rights as the students at Carolina? They're gonna say, yeah, <laughs> and so are the professors. And it's because of a tradition in higher education that most private universities have by contract or custom imported free speech values as if they were public universities. So they don't, they don't have to, but generally it's the same. So now let's ask you, let's explore your question. Um, the, the idea of designated free speech zones or designated safe zones, all right, is not entirely foreign to First Amendment thinking. We, don't, we have never used those words, but we have similar concepts that are an old part of First Amendment law. And I've already sort of alluded to it. So it's a thing called public forum law. It's a dense area of constitutional law. And basically it says that in our open spaces, those are called our traditional public forums, streets, sidewalks, parks, there is a wide open marketplace free speech right for anybody to go there at any time and talk. Now, you can have certain rules, you can have permit requirements, you can, you can, you can impose, you know, you've gotta have toilets, you've gotta have water stands, you can, you can impose reasonable neutral regulations on the use. You can have a maximum occupancy, how many people can be in this park at a time. But you can't say, no, we don't like the Pope, you can't be there. Or you can't say, no, we don't like the Klan, you can't be there. So that, that applies. Then the next level down are, is something called designated public forums. And these are usually indoor. These are typically spaces, a lot of times these are on university campuses, <laughs> that the government has turned into places of free expression. And so the same rules apply. And so very often a, a auditorium on a campus, a municipal auditorium, um, indoor spaces in major government buildings are treated as, tr as designated public forums. And again, you can have rules, like only during certain hours, you can have rules about you know, maximum density, you can have rules about having to sign up ahead of time, but you can't discriminate as to who gets to use it or who doesn't get to use it. You've got to let a conservative student group use it as much as a liberal student group. You've got to let, you know, if, it, you have, if you have a racist student group on your campus, they in theory could use the room under traditional First Amendment theory as long as they sign up and, and, and follow the rules, okay? Then there's a place called a limited forum. You'll see how this all makes sense in terms of your zones. And these are places where you can restrict it to certain users. You can say only library patrons get to use this. Only members of the university community get to use it. You can even res restrict it to certain topics. This is a room for health discussions, or this is a room for law discussions. But you can't discriminate on the basis of viewpoint within it. So if you have a rule, if you have a room for legal discussions, you can't let the people against Roe v. Wade um, in and the people in favor of Roe v. Wade out. You know, the, you can't let the people against Kavanaugh in. People, you know, you gotta have, a, it's gotta be even handed. And then finally, there are what are called non-forums. This is government owned property where you have no free speech right at all. And typically offices, a faculty office, you, students don't have a right to come in and start marching on your desk, you know. Um, but there's a lot of places that are government property, but they're not open for free expression for, for people who want to do it. So let's think, through the, let's think through that in terms of either the free speech zone or the safe zone. If a university says, we've got certain places on this campus that we're gonna designate as public forums, a plaza in front of the student center or you know, a big green space that, that goes by the president's you know, offices and stuff, and it says, we're gonna designate that as a public forum, then that's kind of a free speech zone and you have a right to speak there. 
um, if a university says, um, we're going to reserve certain spaces for private use only, and groups can go there, but if they have that space, they get to exclude others because it's their space for that moment, I think that's okay. Now, what would be trickier is if a university had a space that anybody could use at any time, but it said in that space, you can't, you can't take you know, pro-Trump positions, you can't take um, racist positions, you can't take anti-Muslim positions. Now you're getting close to a violation of the First Amendment in traditional terms because you've created a limited forum, it looks like, but you are, you are picking sides there. Last little piece to give your answer. Um, I don't know the Rowan campus that well, I know it a little bit. My guess is there's parts of this complex that are owned by the university, that are university property, and there are also New Jersey streets and New Jersey highways and New Jersey sidewalks going through them. And this is true of most American campuses, particularly in a more urban setting. And, you know, on those streets and sidewalks, you're in a traditional public forum. And you, you, the university has no authority to kick people out of that or to prevent protests there. Which where you get into legally trickier places is once you cross onto the university property. So I feel like something that's coming to head right now is um, the expanding um, interpretation of Second Amendment laws and yeah. the ability to carry yeah. guns and that as a form of self-expression yeah. and then that coming in conflict with the yeah, um, First about Amendment. That. Right. Can you deconstruct how I that's going to be? I'll do the best I can. So looking. it's how the Second Amendment, the right to bear arms and carry arms, intersects with the First Amendment when you have protests like this. And I did give a legal opinion to this task force. There are people that agree with me and people that disagree with me on the legal opinion. So the, the normal, so first of all, we have a lot more highly developed First Amendment law than we do Second Amendment law. The US Supreme Court has only heard two or three modern Second Amendment cases, two or three. There are four or 500 First Amendment cases. And one of the things that lower courts are trying to figure out is, should we take some of the thought processes that exist in the First Amendment and bring them into the Second Amendment, okay? So what do we know about the Second Amendment? Well, we know that the Supreme Court held in this case called Heller, Washington, D.C. case, that there is an individual personal right to possess a gun, at least in one's home, as a form of self-defense. We know that, okay? Is there a right to carry the gun in public spaces? And the Supreme Court hasn't talked about that, but an increasing number of lower courts across the United States are saying, yes, that too, that you have a Second Amendment right to carry a, at least a small arm as a matter of self-defense. Not every court has held that. And of course, states vary widely on their state laws about carrying weapons, open carry, concealed weapons, permit requirements, et cetera. Virtually everybody agrees it's okay under the, under the Second Amendment to have a permit requirement. Here was, the, here was the headache in Charlottesville. Virginia has a very pro-gun legis, uh, legislative regime. Virginia has a rule that um, doesn't allow restrictions on the possession of, a, of at least certain small arms in the open spaces of Virginia. Um, therefore, the police could not prevent the supremacists who came armed or the militia groups who came armed. And there were militia groups, by the way, on both sides. There, was, there were militia groups that were sort of neutral. There was also an interesting left-wing a militia group called the Redneck Revolt of left-wing um, uh, pro-progressive um, protesters who were there to try to give support to the, uh, the counter-protesters. And they actually were the people that formed the security at St. Paul's Church outside of the UVA campus where thousands of people gathered to pray before the first, before the first rally. Um, so I was asked this question by the task force. If we changed Virginia law to allow local cities, counties, municipalities, universities 
to ban guns on the campus or at events, would that violate the Second Amendment? That was, my, that was the question posed to me. And I said, well, of course, I'll, we don't know until there's a case. But in my view, the better answer would be yes. And my, but it gets a little more complicated. I said, because I'm sure you can ban guns from an airport. I'm sure you can ban guns from schools. The Virginia Supreme Court you said you could ban guns from a state university. It said George Mason could ban guns from its campus. Uh, so what about a park rally? And I said, well, I would analogize it to a rock concert or some other thing where they can check you for drugs or check you for contraband, check you for weapons at the door. It seems to me that you may have a right to carry your gun across that park during normal hours, but if there's a rally going on, the park is no longer the traditional open space. It's basically, it's basically kind of a rental now. It's a closed space, and because of our because of our experience with violence in mass settings and our experience with violence in these combustible settings, um, you should be able to have a rule that says, check your weapons at the door if you're coming to this rally on either side. Now, you have already raised the hardest question. But what if it's a gun rally? <laughs> what if the bringing of the weapon is part of my free expression? I want to show people I have a right to carry my rifle. And my answer, which could be wrong, is I can see that the weapon itself could be a symbol, not a weapon. I had a debate with this with Justice Scalia when I argued my case. But I believe you could force the person to have it unloaded. So you could say, we can't prevent you from carrying that thing because we know you're doing it to make a Second Amendment point, or, or, but we can force you to not have it be actually lethal. Now, you're all smart enough that you could press me. Yeah, but what about a spear? What about a club? What about all kinds of other stuff? And that's, I'm not, I ain't perfect. I ain't got answers to everything. <laughs> and, and that's why we litigate this stuff. But I'm of the view that you could clamp down. There have been some cities recently that have passed laws prohibiting weapons at these sorts of rallies. And so we'll start to see some court cases fairly soon. Yes, ma'am. So I'll, I'll, I'll repeat the question because um, our, our student is very soft-spoken, but a very good question. And then maybe we'll adjourn, and I'll be happy to hang around and take some weight off my knees and answer any questions you want, if anybody wants to ask me some questions afterwards. So here is the question. I made the point that the general rule is that you have a right to engage in offensive speech in the open marketplace. Now, that doesn't mean it's limitless. You don't have a right to incite violence in the open marketplace, and you don't have a right to engage in threats in the open marketplace, but you do have a right to, to be insulting. That's sort of the distinction in the open marketplace. And the question asked is, well, isn't our president someone who is in, 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 in crossing the line all the time, inciting violence and engaging in threats and doing more than just insulting people? And, you know, my, I certainly will say this president insults people on an hourly basis, probably, on, on his Twitter account and engages in disparaging statements and dispar in statements that I think are unbefitting of, the, of, the, of, of a president of the United States in either party and, 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 and often cause harm to human dignity. And, and, and I also will tell you, I think sometimes his statements empower people who are truly violent. And there's no question that many of the people in Charlottesville on the right felt solace and empowerment and kinship. People like Richard Spencer were openly, you know, thrilled with Mr. Trump being elected president. And so th there's no question that there's some connection there. Now, my, my First Amendment answer is I don't think, I, I, I haven't looked at every single thing the president's ever said, but I don't think the president has said something that is racist or anti-Muslim, which he has, so I don't, I'm not saying he has, that I would say would meet the test for incitement or meet the test for threat. It would be treated as insulting and as inappropriate, but not, not, not incitement in the way the law knows incitement, because incitement is a very difficult test. It has to be direct, this is the First Amendment rule, it has to be directed to the incitement of imminent lawless action and likely to produce such action. So if President Trump said, I hope that some of you will go out there and beat up some Muslim because they're our enemy. 
That might be an incitement. But when he just makes statements that are regarded as generally disparaging of Islam, that's insulting, not incitement. So that, that's my best legal answer. But, I'm, but I'm, I think we're, you and I probably are in agreement that he, he often encourages and empowers those who are predisposed. They hear the message and it, and it fires them up to go do bad things. Well, listen, folks, you've been a great audience. I appreciate it very much. Thanks for coming out. And I'll hang around, take some questions.